I want to talk to you about my favorite subject. It's Jesus. Well, you hung around for the second meeting. Can you put up with this one more time? You sure can. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a... I'm a man that's had the privilege for, I know I don't look it, thank you so much in advance for your support for what I'm about to say, work with me, that's had this wonderful privilege starting next year, the first will be my 50th year of declaring this gospel across this great world. In most continents I've preached, in great crusades and all of this kind of thing. Just think, two little preacher's kids. Just can't believe it sometimes. And you know, the time just whew, like that. Of course, I'm still young, but I'm saying that the time, work with me, gang, and the time just sort of like it does this thing too. And you wake up one day and you think, wait a minute, what's going on in the mirror here? What's working? What's going on? But, but I think about all of this, you know, and how the time has gone by and I've preached and I'm preaching the Royal Albert Hall in London, and you name it, I've probably been pretty close by, and even out in Africa, many places, and under a, a little tree preaching to the Maasai tribes like you used to see in the National Geographic, you know, those guys with the spears and all that stuff, and the cans hanging off their ear, ear lobes and, and, and the thing, and just like I saw when I was a little boy, and I had the privilege of preaching to all over Africa and continents and the world. And I'm honored for that, honored for it. So I don't have a sad tale. I was trying to think of one. I can't think of any. It's just been a journey that I'm grateful for. But what has been on my heart more than ever at this stage of my life is the subject that I like to talk about the most is this man called Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Get it together here, Thompson. I'm tearing up too much. Say, stop it, Dwight. No, I'm not going to. I'll just keep going with it. <laughs> but I'm saying it just overwhelms me at this stage of my life to think I've had this privilege to talk about the number one subject that's on the lips of everyone, whether they like him or whether they don't. In fact, you can't even fill out your check with having to put the date up there that marks his arrival. So whether you like him or whether you don't, it's truly irrelevant to the fact that he is the King of kings and he is the Lord of lords and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And the greatest believer of them all is the devil himself. He will bow the knee. So I want to talk to you about my favorite subject, and his name is Jesus Christ, and I've talked about him all day right here, and that's what I want to talk about in this service. His name is Jesus. I mean, he's going to listen to me for a few minutes. All right. I grew up, as I said in the early meetings, I grew up in a Pentecostal home. My dad was a preacher, and probably some of you know that, so I've been here from time to time, but he was a Pentecostal preacher. It was long before Charismatics and long before all of this other that we call it today. It was Pentecost, really old-fashioned Pentecost. And, uh, you know, that's where the glory would fall and the power would come down, and there was a stigma attached to it. And the stigma was, you know, these little fledging churches that bought the land where it was cheap. And uh, not the downtown church, but it was always those little places you had to go because the property was less expensive. And uh, so that's where you wound up and everybody made fun of you. And Mark, my first fight in school was when a, a, a Baptist kid called me a holy roller preacher's kid. His name was Brian Hollingsworth, and I decked him. <laughs> and uh, there I said it, and I'm not ashamed of it either, bless me. <laughs> And so, you know, that was just kind of, the, kind of the part of it, you know, and the power would fall and the police would come out from time to time and said, y'all need to hold it down. And people laughed and said, oh, that Holy Ghost bunch and that talking in tongues, it'll just blow over. And it did. It's blown all over the world. And, and today it has done that. 
So being raised, though, in that environment, being raised, you know, back before we even had nurseries, and, and we were raised in that little frame building, you know, that frame church, about 500 people in there, and no, no nurseries or anything when I was a baby. They just, mother just put a little pallet down there on the floor, and she stuck you there, and that's where you were raised as a kid. And uh, you got out of line, she jerked you up and just wore you out in front of everybody. <laughs> and they're all staring at you saying, beat him for me. <laughs> beat that kid for me. And so that's the, you know, that's the way it was. And then when the, then we'd start singing, I'll fly away or when the saints go marching in and, and then the hallelujah march would start or we'd call it the Jericho march. People, you don't know what I'm talking about. Some of you don't, but it was a good thing. And we got happy, and the old saints would start just walking around with their hands raised, singing when the saints go marching in. And, and then Mother just scoot us in under the front seat. So that's where we didn't get stomped to death during the <laughs> Hallelujah March. But that was a good place to be under there because that's where all the gum was. <laughs> so as a little kid, you're laying under there looking at the bottom of the pew, and you just reach up and get the gum off of there. chewed it for a while. When the coast was clear, you'd stick it back for the next kid that's going <laughs> to. Maybe I did. Maybe I didn't. Only God knows. But it was that wonderful environment. And then my dad, my dad was one of these uh, Pentecostal preachers. And I think if there was ever one distinguishing characteristic that really stood out, and this is, this is not a, an implication here, but I, so many that I see throughout the land, not here I want to emphasize, but it was the, the, the difference that I would note in, in, in the new young people that are preaching and pastoring today across the country, too many I should say, exclusions are noted, let's understand that, is that they understand all of, all of the mechanics of building a church, but what you really deduce from that generation of my father, you really got the impression these men know about the man of whom they're preaching about. Does that make sense to you? In other words, it's not some alluding to some kind of higher, higher mental ascension or mental understanding or textbook understanding of their subject, but what they knew, well, let me put it like this. They were talking about somebody that they had a personal relationship with. Which brings me to the next word, and it's called religion. They didn't know anything about religion, but they knew a lot about relationship. And if ever there's one thing I learned from Kenny Foreman that always e exemplified this when he stood behind this pulpit, when you got around him, you get the impression Kenny Foreman knows something about the man of whom he preaches. But then that mantle didn't rest solely upon himself. You can't be around Pastor Ken nor Pastor Kurt with getting the impression this isn't just a job to them. They're in love with the man in whom they represent. And that man's name is Jesus Christ. Pastor Ken and Pastor Kurt knows the man. Well, my introduction to that was my dad that it was more than religion or anything like that. It was, it was they, they knew the man of whom they spoke. In fact, Paul put it this way in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, and I only delete just a few words out of it to just make my point, but it, it emphasized what Paul's obsession was. May I use that word? It became his consuming obsession was to talk about the man who changed him on the road to Damascus. The man who had legal authority in his pocket to imprison Christians. It wasn't called the church in that day. It was called the men that were, or the people that were in the way. The followers of Christ were called those that were in the way. When Jesus said, I am the way, then those that followed him, it wasn't called the church till it got into the book of Acts, but it was called the followers of Jesus in the New Testament in the Gospels were those that were the followers of the way. 
Well, then that's where Paul ran into the man called Jesus was on in the way. Even though Jesus had ascended, uh, Jesus can come back anytime he wants to, by the way. He can show up right now, you know, he... He came back, and on that road to Damascus, he had that encounter with Jesus, and he never stopped talking about it. Are you listening to me? Everybody's listening to me. Said, "You go, boy." And so he was. He was talking about the way, and so he couldn't stop the life-changing experience that took place in Paul's life when he stood before King Agrippa. He stood before Felix. He stood before Drusilla. He stood before the Sanhedrin. And in every one of those occasions, all he could talk about was the transformation that took place. Oh, I'm about to shout. I'm in the now. I'm about to shout right now. You don't need to. I'll do it for all of us because you know why? I think about where I was when he reached out his hand and he changed my life and I can't stop talking about it. I should be in hell, but he reached out and he saved my life. Does anybody else relate to that? Well, don't patty cake make some noise. Hallelujah. So Paul said to the Philippians in chapter 3, a part of verse 10, he said, this was his favorite subject, that I may know him, Jesus, in the power of his resurrection. So here I am after all these years, I want to talk about Jesus. So my dad really was influential, I think, more than anyone possibly early in life as a child. And here's the way it was introduced to me. My baby brother and I would be sitting on the front seat. And my daddy would preach. It didn't matter what he was preaching. Sooner or later he'll get to this. Just at some point this will happen. And all of a sudden Rex will nudge me or I'll nudge my baby brother Rex. And we're watching for it and we're going, here, here, here it goes. Here he comes. Okay, it's going to happen. Look at it, look at it. Look at him now. Look, he's going to do it. He's going to do it. And dad's face would get real red. And, and the tears will start coming out. And his eyes just, I mean, you can just see the, you can just see the transformation. That he can't hold it back anymore. And right in the middle of his message, he's just overcome with his love for his Savior. And he'll go, God is more real to me. He'll look at his hand. That my right hand. So Rex will be sitting next to me. And he'll go, God <laughs> is more real than my right hand. And then we're going, oh yeah, hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And we're kind of laughing at it. But you see, we didn't get it. We just thought that was funny. Just kind of, you know, cute. We'd play church. We'd church across the street, and we'd go across the street and play church. Nobody's in there. So we'd get a chair, I Rex one, and put it up behind the pulpit, and we're the preacher. And then Rex would sit in the back, all the way on the back seat, because that's where all the sinners were. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, see, I see that hand, brother, right back there. And so, and so, you know, then so I'd do whatever it was, you, then you'd finally just, all you'd do is you'd go, God is more real than my right hand on Rex would go, oh, glory, I feel it, hallelujah. Come on down here, brother, and get saved right now. And so he'd come down here, and, well, and, that, and that was funny to us as little children, you know, playing, playing church. Then I, then I realized one day when I, when I grew up, I, I found out something that what my dad was talking about that was to me funny then, I have a better understanding of it now. See, when I look out over this country, I look out over this country that there's a word that floats around and has since the beginning of time, it seems like, and it's a word called religion. 
But the point that I really feel led of the Holy Spirit to make to you today that if I could ever say something about this generation, the generation that is packing churches, that are packing churches that have no experience with the man called Jesus Christ. There's four major religions in America. It's Judaism and and, uh, Islam and Hinduism and uh, Christianity. Judaism said that Jesus is a good man, rabbi, teacher. And they're looking for the Messiah. That's the difference. Christianity is we have found him, and Judaism is still looking for him. So <laughs> we, we pray they finally get out of the Old Testament. Don't leave it. Just move on over into the New Testament and meet the man called Jesus Christ. Islam, Muhammad, yeah, he, they say he is the God, but that God, they make clear in the Quran that uh, God had no son. So that's not the God that we seek. It's not the same God, is it? Because the God that we serve comes out of Christianity. And Christianity, that Jehovah Almighty God, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his be only begotten son. Oh, well, let me just shoot it in right here. There is only one name given under heaven whereby men might be saved, and that is the infallible, unchanging name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the Most High God. So if you're Buddhist, that basically also suggests that Jesus was just a a great uh, man and a great teacher. But you see what we have going on in our world today? We're hearing a lot of evangelists. Uh, They're not evangelists as we think of it, but they're people that have influence and power and money. And one woman that's a billionaire that has her own network made the statement recently. She's talking about religion. They said, well, this way, that way, that way, that way. And one woman spoke up and said to her, said, well, wait a minute. I read in my Bible that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. And she made it clear to this woman, Jesus Christ is not the only way to heaven. Just as long as everybody's trying, we're all going to get there. Well, my Bible says there will be people like that, and that doesn't affect me, but think about how many people that now have heard that, and they're around, well, it doesn't really matter how I live or what I believe, just as long as I'm trying to do my best, I don't even have to think. But the fact of the matter is that Christianity implodes upon itself, were it not for the one that gave it validity. From Genesis to Revelation, I know that it is true because of one thing that happened. He was born of a virgin Mary. Yes, that's part of it. And he lived a sinless life. Yes, that's part of it. And he was indeed beaten 39 stripes. That's part of it. And he himself was crucified upon the cross of Jesus Christ. And he died and cried, it is finished. But what gave this validity what gave it absolute authenticity, what made every... That's why we're here today. Had it not been for the next event, on that Friday when he drew the last breath, demons rejoiced. The devil said, that's it, we've shut him up. Only one showed up at that crucifixion. His name was John. The rest of them had scattered. The church is in disarray. Fear was rampant. And now then hell is rejoicing. The Roman soldiers are all there grappling and gambling for his garment. That's Friday. And it's the biggest day in history to the enemies of Christ. Friday. It's done, finished, over, zip. It's over. Christ, we killed him, it's finished. It's premature to celebrate anything on Friday. It's not a good day for celebration because Jesus said something that the 120 remembered it. They would show up in the upper room shortly thereafter, but he made a statement. Hell forgot it on that third day, on the third day, 
on the third day, the Son of Man will rise again. Friday rolled around, it's black, the noonday sun, everything has gone black. Saturday rolled around, but on Sunday, something happened. Sunday morning, the sun came up. And why I'm here today, and I have preached for these 50 years, and Cathedral is faith is here because of this one event that authenticated everything. On that third day, Scripture says, God rose Jesus from the dead. God rose Jesus from the dead. Yes, hallelujah. And Jesus that was dead walked out of that tomb and he raised his voice and he said, I'm back. Well, somebody shout hallelujah. So this, oh pastor, I'm hurrying up here. I'm, Watching that clock, I'm doing my, I'm going fast. <laughs> so the whole thing about religion isn't, isn't, uh, well, 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 let me put it this way. There, everybody, everybody give me five minutes. Everybody will give me five minutes. Hold your hand up, five minutes. All right, leave it up. Five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 30, 30. <laughs> Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so very much. Let, let me just hang in here, can I, for just another moment or two. Now watch this. A lot of people believe that it doesn't matter which way you go, but, but you see, the only way from this pile of dirt, this big planet here of dirt called earth, to get from earth to heaven, it's not Buddha and it's not Mohammed, and it's not good works, and it's not Joseph Smith, it's not any other way. Let's be clear. There's one way, and it's through a man, not a religion, in his name. <laughs> Jesus! Shout it out, Jesus! Jesus! So, so many people now believe that they're Christians automatically because they're an American. <laughs> American Christians. It's almost like it's synonymous. American Christian. We see that isn't the true. That isn't the case. That isn't true at all. And then they they believe they're culture Christians. By that I mean. Your daddy is a Christian, your mother was a Christian, you come from a Christian background, all your family is Christian, so that sort of automatically, it's just like retroactive, it's just you're in it, it goes all the way back into your, your, your lineage, and that makes you automatically a Christian. But you see, that's not the way it works. Matthew 10, 32 says, but if you confess me before men, I will confess you to the Father, but if you deny me, verse 33, before men, I will deny you to the Father. So no decision or indecision is a decision. You must be born again. So in other words, in other words, you, you come into church is wonderful. I'm telling you right now, I can put my hand on a stack of Bibles and tell you that this is absolutely, this is absolutely correct. I believe if I lived within 50 miles of this place, I wouldn't miss being here to hear that Pastor Ken open that Bible and preach the Word. And besides all that, not only hear him preach the Word, just to get to hang out with you. 
I'd go to church here. And as wonderful as that is, me being born in my father's house didn't save me. And you coming to church doesn't automatically save you. It may be a cultural thing in your mind. This is what we do. It's a culture. It's an American culture that we're involved in. That's why we come to church. But listen to me closely. You coming in here doesn't automatically save you any more than you going into a garage make you a car. Did you hear what I said? Well, let's put a caboose on this thing right quick. Here's the here's whole thing that I want to get over to you. What stood out in my mind was that my dad, after 65 years, he preached. He died in 1990. I buried my mother, preached her funeral three and a half months before my father. And my dad, his whole life, would say, God's more real than my right hand. And now it's 1990. It's the it's month of October. And my father's laying in the hospital. And he's getting ready to take his flight. Oh, by the way, this is not your permanent home. He's getting ready to take his flight into that place called heaven. And so I'm thinking... I'm thinking, you know, later, think about all how much I adored that precious man. He just was, he was just something else to be around. So I'm laying there and looking at him. I mean, sitting there looking at him. He's in his bed, and it's going to be hours now. He's getting ready to go home. And, And he had two favorite songs among many others, but these two, he had sing. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arm. So he started singing. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arm, leaning, leaning, be quiet, I work alone, safe. (laughs) You know how much I love you, don't you? You are just... It's your fault I act this way, by the way. You're just too much joy to get to preach to. I just love you for that, and thank you for the privilege. And so I just love you so much. It's just like anybody couldn't preach in this environment shouldn't even try. And so he had just seen that little song, and all of a sudden, here I am. Here I am sitting by him, and I'm, I'm thinking, oh, I noticed something. He's getting that look on his face. Now he's 85. And I'm thinking, oh, my Oh my, it's about to happen. And the family's around. I find myself getting out of the chair and scooting up on the edge of the bed. And I got kind of on my side next to him, kind of stretched out there where I could look at him. And all of a sudden, I see that hand go up. Everybody do it with me. Kind of get your hand up. And you kind of let a little tremble be in it. That ha- and I'm thinking, now I revert back to being a child. And all of a sudden, I'm, I can say it out loud. He's going to do it. He's actually going to do it at age 85. And all of a sudden, he kind of glances over at me, and he'd call me Dwighty when I was a kid. He'd go, Dwighty, God is more real to me than my right hand. Everybody do it with me. Put your hand on your face. Let's say it again. God is more real than my right hand. Well, I did it. There it was. When I was a child, I heard him say it. All of his life, he said it. Now he's getting ready to go into the presence of God. In other words, what he got from the beginning of his encounter with Jesus lasted with him all the way until he made it home. All right, I'm going to close with this. I'm the world's greatest closer. I've been known to close an hour. (laughs) So you've got to know him for yourself. Have y'all noticed I've been working my way down? I'm all the way down here now. 
Pretty soon I'll be in the balcony. <laughs> but it's, if it's religion, all you found, it might be only 18 inches from head to heart, but it might as well be 18,000 miles. Until you know what I'm talking about, this is all foreign. It's in your heart, not religion. But it's this man, Jesus Christ, that reached down and saved your soul. And I can honestly say this. And he walks with me, and he talks with me. Can I just get here just for the fun of it? And he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. You know what my number one priority is at this stage of my life is that I can know him more personally, more intimately, more closely than I've ever known him before. Do you realize that Jesus is a friend who walks in when the whole world has walked out? He's never once condemned me. He's never once said, you're no good, you're no good, baby, you're no good. He's never once said anything to me like that. I just thought of that, sister. It just came to me. Somebody ought to write a song about that. No, he, I mean, have you ever thought about that? When I fail, he doesn't say, I shouldn't have given my life for you. He'll, he'll say, let me help you up. Let's get back in the race. This time you're going to make it. Anybody get what I'm, if I get the convinced you're, you're getting it, I'll, 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 give, I'll give it up here in a minute. But are you understand? Do you know him? Do you know him? Do you know him personally and intimately? This is my second close. This man, he was the greatest, unarguably the, uh, inarguably the greatest British actor of all time. He would come to America and he would go all through putting on this, uh, this uh, act and uh, stage actor. And he'd go into every town and so on. He went into one town and, he, and at the end of his performance he was known for, the, oh, he was his diction and his tone. And, Oh, he just had this thing about him, you know, this Great Britain, this British thing they got going, that British thing that they've got, and people were just mesmerized by him. And so at the end of his performance, he got up and he did this, he said, and he always did this at the end of every performance, he would quote the 23rd Psalm. And at the end of the, when he would get through with that, the crowd, it was so beautiful. The, his diction, his tone, how articulate he was, that British sound. People were just mesmerized by this man's uh, un, un, incredible ability. And they would roar to their feet in applause. And in one, one of these great moments, a, a man jumped up on the stage without him even realizing it and just hugged him and embraced him and said, I never heard anything like this in my life. It's the most beautiful thing in the world. The way you say the 23rd Psalm and then he said would you allow me sir to say it too and what the great actor didn't know this was a born again Pentecostal on fire Holy Spirit filled Christian man and the actor and well in a very condescending tone well you want to say this after me the 23rd Psalm if you dare if you dare so this, this unlearned, uneducated in the art of acting stood and from his heart began to talk about somebody. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. And when he got through, the crowd didn't jump to their feet to applaud. There was not a dry eye in the house. People were wiping tears from their eyes, including this great Briton, uh, British actor. And the actor, this great actor looked at him and said, I don't understand this. 
I have gone to the greatest schools of learning and art and acting the world has ever known. And I quote the 23rd Psalm and they give me a standing ovation and you, 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 sir, quote it. You. There's not a dry eye in the house, including myself. I don't understand the difference. What is the difference? The Christian man looked up with tears in his eyes at the actor with tears in his eyes. And he said, sir, the difference is you know the psalm, but I know the shepherd. I know the man, Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. So all the doors are locked. You can't get out. <laughs> Ushers, padlock them good, put chains on the door. Everybody look at this preacher, look at me. Everybody do this. I'm looking at you and you're looking at me. If you walk out of this room today without experiencing the life-changing power of Jesus Christ, you've missed the whole point. It is not religion. It's Jesus Christ, the Son of God, will change your life. Third and last close. Everybody say, you go, boy. We can take it. This young preacher, he was a uh, he must have been much like Pastor Ken, on fire for God, in love with Jesus, went into this town to start a church. And I mean, he already had this building. He was renting this schoolhouse packed. And in burst the door came this man. And I'm telling you, the place was jammed. Everybody, when he walked in, knew who the guy was. He was mean and he hated God, he said, and he hated church, and he hated everything. He was disrespectful. He was obstinate, hateful, mean, you name it, he was it. He came roaring down that aisle, and he has run off many a preacher trying to start a church in that town. He came up on that platform right in front of that man's message, and he said, you get out of this town. We don't want a church in this town. We don't believe in all that stuff you're preaching. There's no truth to that Bible. You get out of here, and you get out of here now, and the people were aghast. Well, that young preacher, what that guy didn't know, he loved Jesus. Nothing intimidated him. He was full of the Holy Ghost. And he always carried an orange with him, an orange, just an orange. And after church, he always heard his good for him. He'd peel the orange and he'd eat it because it would relax his throat. So the guys just chewed him out in front of everybody, and he's standing right there. And he just picked up the orange, the young preacher did, and looked at the guy, and he said, Sir, what is this? He said, it's an orange. What do you mean, what is that? You're trying to make a fool out of me. It's an orange. And the man politely said, no, you've already done that, but what is this? <laughs> it's an orange. He said, sir, he said as he unpeeled it, he's talking to the man in front of the crowd, he unpeeled it. Then he, then he quartered it, and he got it all sectioned like this. And then the preacher, while he's talking to him, just stood there very relaxed and took a bite of it. And he chewed on it a little bit, and the guy's still glaring at him, waiting for a response. And then after the preacher took a bite of it, he looked at the atheist, and he said these words. You know, it's terrible being an atheist. On your tombstone, you're all dressed up and no place to go. And then when an atheist feels thankful, who can they thank? I had an atheist. You know, they get mad at you because we don't believe we, we, that we all come from monkeys. That's what atheists believe. So the next time you see an atheist, give them a banana. It's just a thought. You can, you can delete that from the message if you want to, but I prefer you not. So he looked at the man after eating that orange, and he said to him, he said, sir, he said, was this a sweet or a sour orange? But he baited him. And he took it. And the atheist said to him, How would I know? I never tasted it. Then how do you know? 
this isn't real about Jesus until you've tasted it. <laughs> oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Everybody get on your feet and clap your hands to the Lord. So everybody in this building that says to me now, this is important, this is big time stuff. You say, Dwight, Dwight Thompson, I, I hear you. I, I get it. I want to know him as I've never known him before. You're here this morning. You have something in your life that shouldn't be there. There's people in this room that have never given their life to the Lord. You're a culture Christian. You just kind of think it's automatic. You're in church. You hear this morning, you say, I've got a hidden sin in my life. Well, let's get rid of that too. Why don't we? Well, I've got unforgiveness. Well, let's get rid of that. You see, you have to forgive others for Christ to forgive you. That's what he said, Mark 11, 25, 26. If you don't forgive others, I can't forgive you. So you've got to do it. Well, you don't know what they did. You know what? Unforgiveness is like you drinking poison and expecting them to die. And you forgiving others doesn't make them right, but it makes you free. So what you're saying is when I come to Jesus, I give up everything to receive him as Lord and Savior. So every man, woman, boy, and girl, when I count to three, you say, Dwight Thompson, why don't you just go on and just lead me in a prayer that I can know that everything in my life is totally and completely right with God. I want to know him. So when I count to three, none of this little wimpy stuff. Well, what will everybody think? I don't know what they'll think, but I do believe they'll say, they'll think it's wonderful. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So you want to know him in the power of his resurrection. You want every sin under the blood. You want to walk out here saying, I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. On three, I want you to throw that hand up as high as you can get it and hold it there. Wait a minute, I hadn't counted yet. Only on three. I want to know him. I've got something in my life, and I want to make everything right with God. I've got something. I need to get rid of it. On three. All right, go ahead. One, two, three. Put your hand up and hold it there. Got something in my life. I just want to make it right with God. Now lift the other hand up. Thank you, Jesus. This is I surrender. Anybody puts a gun in your ribs, this is what you do. Like that. It means I give up. Oh, by the way, have I told you I love you? I sure love you. You're a precious people. Now let's say this together to our Lord and Savior. Precious Savior. Holy Jesus Christ, Son of God, thank you for dying for my sin, washing all my sins away, cleansing me and making me new. I trust you now for my salvation. And from this moment on, I give you my life publicly. I acknowledge you, not Buddha, not Mohammed, nor any other God, I renounce all other gods, and it is Jesus Christ and He alone I receive as Savior and Lord. Thank you for saving my soul and cleansing me and making me new. In Jesus' name, I am born again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.